everybody to another uh, global immunotalk. Uh, my name is Carla Rothlin and I'm here today with one of the co-organizers, Matteo Yanacone, uh, who will introduce our speaker today. But before that, I just want to remind you that next week we will have Andres Hidalgo with us presenting his global immunotalk. So please join us next week. Uh, thank you so much, Matteo. The, you know, all is yours to introduce the speaker. Thank you very much, Carla. And it is really my great pleasure to introduce today uh, my friend Philippe Bousseau as today's Global Immunotalk speaker. Uh, Philippe obtained his PhD at the University of Paris 6 uh, under uh, Philippe Kurilski's supervision, uh, characterizing the composition and variability of TCR repertoires. He then moved to UC Berkeley, where he joined uh, Ellen Roby's lab. And at Berkeley, uh, Philippe pioneered the use of two-photon imaging uh, to study immune responses in vivo. And as part of um, a landmark trio of papers published in Science in 2002, uh, Philip used uh, two-photon imaging to observe how thymocytes run the gauntlet of positive selection in three-dimensional uh, thymic organ uh, culture. And in the following year, he extended this technique to the study of T-cell interactions with dendritic cells in intact lymph nodes. And these pioneering studies uh, inspired a number of labs and certainly inspired me, uh, I was just starting my research training, uh, to wanting to study cellular behavior in vivo. After his uh, extremely successful postdoc, uh, Philip returned to Paris uh, in 2005 uh, to establish his lab in the Department of Immunology at Pasteur, um, department that he now heads. And with the help of innovative functional imaging approaches, uh, mm -hmm. Philip continued to explore and manipulate mm -hmm. immune responses in the context of disease pathogenesis. And over the last 15 years or so, his lab helped uh, redefine the process of T-cell activation in vivo, establishing how T-cells engage, interact, and detach from dendritic cells in lymph nodes. He identified a, a new cellular pathway implicated during graft rejection. His work in the field of infectious diseases offered the first demonstration that effective cytokines were acting over extended distances in the infected tissue to effectively control intracellular pathogens. And he introduced the concept of tissue-wide immunity. His lab further established the existence of a quorum sensing mechanism within immune cells acting to terminate inflammation. In the context of cancer, his group identified the distinct roles of T-cells and NK-cells in tumor cell killing, as well as the impact of immune responses on intratumor genetic heterogeneity. And finally, he made important contributions to our understanding of immunotherapies by identifying cellular and molecular mechanisms regulating anti-CD20 uh, antibody and anti-CD19 CAR T-cell therapies against lymphomas and by establishing the basis for the anatomical specificity of the graft versus leukemia effect and of the graft versus host disease during allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. In recognition of his outstanding work, uh, Philip received a number of awards, including an Embo Young Investigator Award, an ERC starting, as well as uh, an advanced grant, and he is an elected uh, Embo member. Philip, uh, thanks uh, so much for accepting our invitation and we very much look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, uh, Matteo, uh, first for inviting me, but, but I really would like to say a, a word to the organizer because uh, what you've uh, accomplished with this uh, Global Immunotalk is, is really uh, wonderful. It has uh, really been uh, so helpful uh, during this period to, to bring the immunology community together and, and to provide this uh, fantastic opportunity to a student and, and postdoc. And so this is, I think, a game changer. Uh, you are all uh, fantastic uh, uh, scientists. I, I know all of you, the organizer, but, but this is a really a special achievement and so on the behalf of all the attendees, I really, really would like to say a big, big, big thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thanks. Appreciate it. So as you know, one feature of the Global Immunotalks is that we ask one question to our speakers uh, to get to know them a little better and to inspire the younger generation of scientists. So <clears throat> what strikes me in your approach to research is your continuous development of novel tools. So the question uh, we'd like to ask you is, 
how did and how does uh, technology inform and inspire your research? Yeah, thank you, Matteo. Um, I think w one of the you know fascinating uh, part of our job is that really from from the start of of the career when you are a student. Uh, already, you, you're standing at the frontier of knowledge, and, and really, the job uh, or your job is to move this frontier and explore uh, novel territories. And uh, as often, there are you know multiple ways to do that. Uh, sometimes it's very simple; it's just to follow up to, to, to your previous uh, lab project and, and basically continue. But sometimes it's uh, a new concept that will uh, make uh, emerge a number of new questions. Uh, and on the top of that, I think that uh, uh, development of technology can be a really, really powerful means to uh, jump into new territories. Uh, and that's because you suddenly have the possibility to uh, explore or to, or to ask uh, a completely new question that nobody could could ask before, uh, or sometimes you can ask an, a very old question that uh, that is important, but you have a new angle uh, to tackle this question, and maybe this is the angle that will be critical for the discovery. So I think very modestly we are trying to keep that in mind in the research, and whenever we have a, a, a scientific question, a biological question, we also try to think in parallel about the tools or the technique that we, we could potentially develop or improve to address this question as effectively as possible. So overall, the technology, when, when they are used uh, in the proper manner, not just to uh, you know, uh, be fancy or to generate uh, just uh, data for generating data, but for, for the reason I was mentioning, uh, can be uh, a, a really a way to improve the originality and sometimes the creativity of the, of the research. I could not agree more and certainly you use it uh, wisely. So thanks again, Philip. And without any further ado, um, I will let you um, share the screen and um, start your talk. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, as I said, it's, it's really an honor uh, and a pleasure to be here. And I will talk about uh, today the, the effort we're making to try to decode mechanisms of tumor immunotherapies, uh, in, in particular using intravital imaging approaches. Now, if we want to understand uh, the basic rule, the basic mechanism of tumor immunosurveillance, or if we want to understand and improve uh, the mechanisms of tumor immunotherapies, we have, are facing with, with a tremendous complexity of the tumor microenvironment. And by complexity, I mean that we are dealing with a multiple cell type. All these cell types are different. Uh, they are all heterogeneous. Uh, this is at the level of the immune cells, at the level of the stromal cells, at the level of the tumor cells. And so uh, really to, to tackle this complexity, uh, one approach is to uh, tease this apart at the level of the single cell. And so uh, uh, thankfully we have a, a set of new technologies that, that can help provide this, this novel insight in front of this complexity. And one of the technology is, uh, for example, single cell genomics that turned out to be very helpful uh, to get additional insight in, in uh, the way the immune system uh, acts within the tumor or respond to immunotherapies. But today I would like to mention another uh, single cell technique uh, that we uh, like a lot uh, in the lab, which is uh, intravital uh, uh, multiphoton microscopy. And that's because uh, a lot of the mechanisms that operate in the tumor microenvironment are in fact encoded by a series of very dynamic and very transient events, such as cellular contact or a transient signaling, uh, signaling event, motility of the cells, cells dying, cells dividing. And, and so capturing this information, we believe it's gonna, it's gonna be very uh, helpful or provide at least additional insight into 
uh, what is operating within the tumor microenvironment. And that's uh, what I will uh, like to, to, to show you today. Uh, my talk will be dedicated to B cell malignancies. These are, uh, of course, uh, uh, a real clinical challenge. They exist in uh, a variety of uh, flavor and variety of diseases, uh, depending, for example, on the stage of differentiation, also different uh, anatomical location uh, in lymphoid organ, in the blood, uh, in the bone marrow. And, and this pattern can uh, further complexify also as the disease uh, progress. And it's, it's uh, really uh, uh, in need for uh, new uh, uh, ways to treat these patients because uh, a large fraction of them can be uh, refractory or have uh, or relapse after their, 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 their therapies. And so uh, I will talk today about two uh, immunotherapies that uh, basically are targeting this, uh, some of these B-cell malignancy. And that there will be uh, the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, which is uh, really uh, uh, maybe the oldest immunotherapy uh, and that has been uh, 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 clinically approved in 1997. And a more recent one, which are uh, anti-CD19 CAR T cells, uh, which you, I'm sure you have uh, all heard of. So for the first part of my talk, let me first uh, introduce you uh, to a really a fantastic scientist, Capucine Grandjean. Uh, she was a postdoc uh, in, in the lab and she has now been promoted uh, as, a, as a, a staff scientist and, and, and she's uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, talented, but also very, very uh, uh, helpful in, in many ways in the lab. So uh, I, I really want to give her all the credit for, for the work that you, you will see uh, on this first part. So anti-CD20 uh, therapy, um, as I said, it's a major breakthrough for the treatment of ma uh, B-cell malignancy. It's an effective therapy for uh, the treatment also of a number of autoimmune diseases, and it acts by depleting malignant or uh, pathogenic B-cells. Yet, and despite uh, more than two decades of clinical use, we still don't fully understand how this therapy is working, in particular the, the mode of action in vivo, the effector cells that are engaged, and the site at which this therapy is effective. Among the mechanisms that have been uh, also shown, I mean, of course, a lot of work has been done around this uh, antibody. There are the, uh, the, the, the uh, complements that can induce uh, cytotoxicity after uh, um, binding of the antibody on the, on the tumor cells. The capacity of cells like NK cells to recognize the uh, constant fraction of the antibody uh, uh, through their FC receptor and uh, deliver a little hit uh, and induce apoptosis in the target cells. And this is a, a mechanism called antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity or ADCC. And macrophage can also do the same, uh, recognize the, this uh, FC portion of the antibody and uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, delivering a little heat, the, the macrophage will engulf uh, and, uh, uh, and digest the target cell. <clears throat> so when we were uh, looking for how um, this antibody would work in vivo, for example, just to deplete the, 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 the B cells, because that's also what the antibody does, um, we uh, realized that the vast majority of the depletion uh, was happening in the liver uh, through the action of the Kupfer cells. And these are the cells that you see here uh, in green. Um, and this is intravital imaging just at the time where we inject the anti-CD20 antibody. And usually the B cells would, would, would circulate within the liver uh, sinusoid very rapidly. But what we uh, uh, observe in, in this setting is that as soon as a B cell uh, was uh, uh, circulating, it will be arrested by a Kupfer cell and, and engulfed and, and digested. 
And the process is extremely efficient and extremely rapid as well. And, and uh, was really the, the key of the, of the ma major way by which the endogenous B cells are depleted. But can that apply to uh, all tumor cells and, and in particular because uh, all tumor uh, B cells may not recirculate and, and uh, uh, we decided to have a closer look at this uh, again using a, a, a mouse model of B cell lymphoma and uh, uh, performing intravital imaging of the bone marrow after this lymphoma has been established. And so this is what you see here. Uh, and, and by and large, what you see is that the vast majority of this uh, uh, tumor are not uh, highly motile and, and certainly not uh, uh, or circulating or recirculating, at least uh, the, 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 during the time frame of, of, of imaging. So these cells are probably not eligible for being depleted by the Kupfer cells in the liver. Uh, and if there are the mechanisms that operate, it has to be uh, to operate locally. And so we decided to uh, uh, investigate what uh, could be this, this mechanism. But first, we uh, characterized the effect of the antibody in this, in this system. And so by uh, treating mice, either like, like most uh, uh, people do, they basically treat the, 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 the mice very, very early on, uh, basically as soon as they're injected with the tumor. Uh, so I think this, these are relatively uh, limited uh, relevance, but it, it does show that the antibody can uh, uh, cure uh, some of these mice in this context. And a more relevant setting where we uh, wait for the tumor to be established and then treat. And here the, the outcome is less favorable. We still see a, a prolongation of the survival, but we don't cure the animals. And this, I think, is something more... more closer to, to the to clinical situation. So the two simple questions uh, that Capucine wanted to address is uh, what is the mode of action of anti-CD20 therapy at, precisely at the tumor site for these non-circulating cells? And also which uh, factor uh, limit uh, the therapeutic efficacy of the therapy? So we decided that we probably would need some, some uh, really new ways and, and, and uh, uh, a, a defined manner to, to identify cells that are dying uh, in, in response to the, to the therapy, uh, in particular to uh, unambiguously identify phagocytosis event, which are not uh, always easy to, to determine. And so uh, we thought that we could exploit the different uh, pH sensitivity of two fluorescent proteins, YFP and CFP. And so by creating a tandem protein with, with both fluorescent protein, uh, what we would expect is that because the YFP is not stable at, um, at low pH, that in, in the acidic environment of a macrophage that would engulf the, the tumor, then the YFP will disappear faster than the CFP. Uh, and we should read that uh, um, by a change in uh, fluorescence, uh, uh, change in, in fluorescence transfer uh, of red, uh, and, and basically we, we read that as a change of color. And indeed, that, that's, that's what we uh, see in this in, vi in vitro experiment. You can see that uh, after a while, after phagocytosis, uh, we start to see these uh, tumor cells going from magenta to blue, uh, suggesting that in, indeed the, the YFP has been uh, uh, turned, turned off. And this uh, you can see uh, in live, uh, where you can also appreciate the color change that is very easy to, to detect. Now we just uh, add a, a, a new, uh, co uh, an additional control for this in vitro experiment. If we block uh, acidification uh, uh, in the macrophages that what you see on the bottom panel, well, the macrophages can still uh, engulf the uh, tumor cells that are coated by the antibody, but you no longer see the color change, uh, suggesting that the probe works the way we had initially imagined. 
So we can make uh, the system just a little bit more complicated uh, because in fact, what we would like to see is, is uh, the, the vast majority of the cell death event. And instead of just using a, a, a simple tandem between the two fluorescent protein, we can add this DVD uh, uh, linker. And uh, this is the motif that will be cleaved by the activated caspase tree. And that has an advantage is that now, each time the cell will undergo apoptosis, there will be a cleavage of the, uh, of the DVD peptide by caspase 3 And uh, this will also result in a threat loss and in a color change. And so with the same reporter, uh, we can identify uh, basically the vast majority, we think, of the uh, cell death event that, that can happen during anti-CD20 therapy. Yet it's still uh, relatively easy to discriminate uh, the, the different type of cell deaths really based on the sequence of events that uh, we, we can see. So uh, when we see this threat loss due to phagocytosis, what we would expect is that the cell is, is engulfed uh, while it's alive. Uh, and then after being engulfed, we see a change of, uh, of color. While when, uh, let's say, a tumor is killed by your NK cells, uh, will undergo apoptosis and then may possibly be cleared by your macrophage. But in that case, the, the macrophage will engulf a cell that has already changed the color. And so by this means, we can uh, discriminate between these two modes of, of cell death. So we decided to bring this uh, uh, strategy in vivo uh, using intravital uh, to photon imaging of the bone marrow uh, in the skull and uh, analyzing really the, the early effect of the injection of the anti-CD20 antibody. Uh, and uh, you will see the, the movie starts uh, typically an hour before we inject the antibody, then we inject the antibody and we continue to record uh, what's happening, looking for possibly a cell death event. And at the beginning, uh, nothing really happened. Uh, but really, uh, after a uh, few minutes after injection of the antibody, we start to see a lot of cells turning blue, uh, meaning that these cells are dying. It's not all of them, uh, but it's uh, 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 quite rapid. And so basically, uh, this experiment tells us uh, two things. One is that there exists local mechanisms for, for uh, uh, destroying this tumor and two that this mechanism operates extremely rapidly after the injection of the antibody. <laughs> so this is the quantification um, of uh, typically uh, uh, the, the type of movie I've just mentioned showing you really the abrupt uh, emergence of cell death after the injection of the antibody. So we can make it a bit more complicated. And, and as I mentioned, it's important now that we visualize also macrophages uh, to try to uh, dissect which type of uh, cell death is operating uh, in the tumor microenvironment. And so uh, what you will see in this movie is, is basically the same. It's uh, tumor cells that will change color, will turn blue. But this is happening, in fact, after phagocytosis, as you will appreciate in, in all of uh, this little square. So there you have a phagocytosis event and then uh, a change of color. We'll maybe replay the, the movie once again to make sure uh, you can see this uh, event. Yet we wanted to really quantify the type of cell death. So we were looking for two different types of uh, uh, events. As I mentioned, on the left panel, what you see is a cell that is uh, phagocytosed that when it's alive and then change color. On the right, there's a cell that uh, first undergo apoptosis or uh, change in color and then is clear by your macrophages. But by and large, you can see that the uh, vast majority of the cell death events are occurring through phagocytosis by ma macrophages. 
what you can uh, see also is that when you have a high uh, tumor burden, like, like here, uh, after uh, several hours, uh, the, the, the vast majority of the tumor remains. So there is indeed a fraction of the tumor that have been eliminated by the treatment, but that's uh, really a suboptimal uh, response. And we, we, we decided to, to try to better understand why, why is that uh, suboptimal. Uh, one of the reasons is probably due to the, uh, uh, the behavior of the macrophages. So most of them, uh, even after the injection of the antibody, are really sessile uh, and are not exploring a large territory within the bone marrow. And this is combined with the fact that uh, in tumor-rich area, we, we tend to see exclusion of the macrophages. So we see a, a, a lower density of the macrophages uh, suggesting that really this special uh, uh, distribution uh, and, and behavior uh, is a first limitation to, to the therapy. The other interesting observation came when um, we uh, also look in time at what uh, is going on. And this is basically uh, graphing the timing where we can see this uh, phagocytosis event. And you can uh, really appreciate that it's really a wave. Uh, it starts very early, as I said, but very rapidly it's terminated. So after one hour, we no longer see uh, uh, efficient phagocytosis by the antibody, and we no longer see uh, cell death in general. So really the, 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 mode, the, 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 the timing uh, during which we see uh, effective activity of the antibody is very, very restricted. So just to uh, conclude on this first part, uh, what I've shown you is that the, the B-cell tumor in the bone marrow are mostly sessile uh, and non-circulating, so not eligible by depletion by the Kupfer cells. Uh, but there's a local mechanism, which is antibody-dependent phagocytosis by macrophages that reside in the bone marrow. That's the primary mechanism, uh, at least in this mouse model. Um, this is initiated extremely rapidly, uh, but was uh, no longer active after one hour. And that uh, explain, uh, we believe, uh, the, the only the partial depletion that, that is seen, uh, and that the low macrophage density is also a limiting factor. And so, uh, what we believe is that a strategy that will aim to increase the density of macrophage and to prevent the, this rapid loss of activity uh, represent a, a, a really attractive therapeutical strategy to optimize this treatment. So let me now switch to the second part of my talk. And again, uh, we will target B cells, uh, this time using CAR T cells. So CAR T cells uh, uh, work in the lab has been uh, performed uh, by uh, two extremely uh, talented and extremely uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, PhD student, Morgan Bouch first and Marine Cazot also uh, together with Capucine that I've introduced already. And, and, and again, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky to have so, to work with such a fantastic scientist. So the principle of CAR T cells is quite easy uh, to explain. I mean, it took a lot of years to, to be developed, but uh, the idea is quite simple. It's basically to undo uh, the patient T cell with uh, a receptor, chimeric receptor, that will contain a recognition domain. And so that's typically an antibody, a fraction of the antibody that recognize here the CD19 molecule, which is also a molecule expressed by B cells. And a signaling domain that will translate this recognition into a cellular function, such as a killing event. So now this, your T cells can recognize and destroy the tumor. This is a so-called personalized therapy because uh, at the moment, uh, the, 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 the patients are actually uh, um, uh, treated with their own T cells, meaning the, the T cells are isolated, uh, activated. They are next engineered to express the CAR that I just mentioned, the chimeric antigen receptor, 
expanded in culture and then reinfused in the patient, the same patient, after a conditioning regimen. Now, this therapy has uh, yielded tremendous uh, uh, results and really remarkable uh, remission rate up to 90%. Uh, nevertheless, typically half of the patient uh, uh, will relapse. So this is highlighting the fact that uh, we uh, continue to, to need to better understand how this therapy uh, actually works and, and how we can improve it uh, for this patient. Uh, and, and more generally, to better understand the biology of CAR T cells in vivo, uh, because of course, this type of, of, of treatment on, and therapy are uh, of great interest to treat additional disease, uh, including solid tumors. And if, you, and if you think about the outstanding question, there are actually many, many outstanding questions. Uh, so I, I'm just alighting four of them, that the, the four questions that I will, uh, uh, we wanted to address in, in priority, which are uh, how efficient is actually CAR T cells mediating, uh, mediated tumor cell killing in vivo? We, we know a lot about their activity in vitro in terms of cytotoxicity, but but a bit less about what they are actually doing in vivo. Patients that are infused with these CAR T cells, in fact, receive a really uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, cellular population that comprise in particular a mixture of CD4 and CD8 T cells uh, that are found in a very different ratio in the different patients. So of course, we, 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 we feel that we, we need to better understand what is the exact functional contribution of each of these subsets to the therapy. Now, uh, CAR T cells are often uh, considered as uh, uh, being on an autopilot mode. They're basically here to kill tumor. So are they acting really autonomously or do they need uh, some uh, uh, more sophisticated in interaction in the tumor microenvironment? And finally, these uh, tumor cells can, can be found in, in multiple uh, anatomical sites. Does it make a difference uh, for the, the CAR T cell activity? So to address this question, we thought that uh, we would uh, uh, make use of an immunocompetent mouse model, uh, just because that will help us really recapitulate the complexity of possible interaction between the CAR T cells and the tumor microenvironment. And there's a lot of study that use uh, immunodeficient uh, mouse model for, for studying CAR T cells and, and that allow, for example, to study a human uh, CAR, of course, and that's uh, very helpful. But for the specific set of questions, we thought it was uh, uh, really important to have you know, fully uh, murine uh, functioning system. Uh, and so that's what we have. We generate CAR T cells um, using a, a CAR that recognizes the mouse, CD19 molecule, and uh, 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 B cell lymphoma uh, also originating from mouse. Uh, and, and we treat these uh, mice that have, uh, in which we have established this lymphoma with the, with the CAR T cells. And uh, to better understand what's happening to the, car, to the, to the tumor cells, we again use a, a reporter, and that's the FRED based reporter for caspase 3 activity uh, that I've mentioned uh, already. Uh, which is again these two fluorescent proteins that are linked with the DVD peptide and that uh, uh, result in a color change when uh, caspase 3 is activated. So when this uh, cell undergoes apoptosis, the molecule is cleaved and uh, the, the two fluorescent proteins are now far apart and we lose the phenomenon of fret. So we see a fret loss. Uh, and that's uh, a really uh, important and, and helpful um, um, way to detect uh, killing event in particular. And we combine all this system with uh, intravital imaging of the bone marrow uh, and start to now analyze how CAR T cells interact with tumor and what are the exact killing dynamics of these CAR T cells. 
So in these images, what you see uh, is basically that the model works uh, really well. So if you transfer CAR T cells, and these are the, the green cells on the, on the right panel, you can see them. Here, uh, you start to see a lot of blue apoptotic tumors, uh, which you don't see if you transfer control T cells. Uh, they, these cells home also very well to the bone marrow, but they don't uh, kill, and that's of course expected. So the nice thing is that uh, we can uh, perform this type of analysis in, in, in real time and, uh, and, and basically monitor the, the killing event that we can detect during uh, our image acquisition. And so, for example, in this movie, you will see uh, four square. And in each of these square, you will see a killing event where by uh, CAR T cells in green interact with a tumor in, uh, in white, and this tumor will uh, uh, turn blue uh, as a result of, of this interaction. And I, I will uh, play the movie, so you see uh, quite rapid interaction, and then the cell, the tumor cells change color, and the CAR T cells detach. And that's really a, a, a very interesting feature, the, the fact that despite the fact that these cells are engineered to express high affinity receptor, they really disengage uh, uh, very effectively from their target, as, as you can uh, see in this movie. And in, in some cases, that's quite helpful uh, because uh, what we can see uh, from time to time is the same CAR T cells engaging multiple targets uh, sequentially and killing sequentially uh, different targets. And so you will see an example here where these two tumor cells will be uh, killed one after another by, by the same CAR. And, and this is what you see uh, on, on this movie. So if you uh, accumulate uh, enough of this event, you can start to uh, be really quantitative about the behavior of these cells. And what we see is that uh, typically on average, uh, it takes 23 minutes. So it's really a rapid process between the time of uh, contact, contact formation to the time of contact detachment. Uh, and usually a single contact is enough to induce uh, the, the, the killing event. So very efficient process, but only for a fraction of the car, because the majority of the car at a given time point are actually not killing at all. Uh, we can image them for uh, several hours and, and, and really nothing happens, uh, indicating that even in this setup where we, we are studying here a, a CDA, positive CAR T cells, and they are prepared in a way that they are really as homogeneous as possible, but still we see a lot of heterogeneity or functional heterogeneity, at least at a given time point uh, in the tumor microenvironment. So is this heterogeneity due to difference in the way the different CAR T cells signal uh, and recognize the tumor? So we address this question by uh, making the system a bit more complex. So now the CAR T cells also express a threat reporter but this time this is a, a calcium reporter. So the, the CAR T cells will go from, from yellow to, to, to red as, as the calcium increase and calcium should increase as a result of antigen recognition. Uh, and we also have our, our threat reporter for apoptosis. And so basically now we're really at the edge of what we can do with uh, intravital imaging because uh, we, we, we trying to distinguish uh, uh, different uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, brown uh, color, but, but I think we, we, we can still manage to do that. And, and so what I want to illustrate here uh, is the behavior of two different CAR T cells that will interact with the same tumor. And the first one will come from, from, from here. It will uh, be um, initially yellow, meaning low calcium. It will first recognize this tumor and you will see an increase in calcium concentration. It will not induce killing, it will detach and then re-engage this other target. There will be another uh, calcium influx. And this time this will be productive because we will see now these tumor cells uh, uh, turning uh, green, uh, indicating uh, apoptosis. And so this, I will play the movie. Uh, you see the first calcium signal, the, the cells detach, re-engage. And now you can see the change of color of the tumor cell. Uh, what's interesting is really in the same location, you have CAR T cells that are really much less effective with extremely little calcium signal. 
and uh, in fact, very uh, and no keening detected. So if you look at the calcium trace, it's, it's strikingly uh, different and, and indicating that, that, that at least part of the functional uh, heterogeneity in the calcium in the CAR T cells come from the, the way they, 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 they signal during contact with their targets. So a lot of heterogeneity with a relatively homogeneous population. So what about CD4 and CD8 CAR T cells? And I will refer them as uh, CAR4 and CAR8 for the, the sake of uh, uh, simplicity. So the, again, the experiment is very simple. We will repeat what we've done, but this time with a purified population of CAR4 or a purified population of CAR8. And, and we decided to analyze them uh, separately to really understand what, what's unique about each subset. And both subsets infiltrate the, the, the tumor site, uh, you can see here. Although in, in our system, CAR8 uh, uh, accumulate much more uh, and, and, and possibly proliferate more than the CAR4 and accumulate at, at a high, much higher frequency at the tumor site. But what's also very different is, is the killing. Uh, CAR8 T cells and, and CAR4 T cells exhibit very different ways of killing their target. And, and again, this is a, 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 a bit uh, different from what has been reported uh, in in vitro studies, where uh, both subsets have, have been shown to exert cytotoxic activity. What we see is that the CAR8 uh, uh, typically are um, killing through this contact that I, 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 I've shown you an example. You see a contact, and then you see the tumor cell changing color. Uh, but uh, for the CAR4, we see much less killing event. We do see some apoptosis uh, like this event uh, occurring uh, at distance from the CAR. And, and, and we see uh, more apoptosis uh, when we have CAR4 than when we don't have CAR4. So the CAR4 are doing something, but, but they are not, or most often not, uh, interacting uh, closely with the cells that will die. This is the overall quantification showing, uh, really reflecting the different mode of killing. Uh, and at the, the top of that also the frequency of killing is much higher for CAR8. Uh, and in our system, when we use them individually, it's really only the CAR8 that provide a, a, a therapeutic benefit, uh, not the CAR4. Yet when we mix them together, we have a better response uh, suggesting that the CAR4 are actually doing something that, that, that is not necessarily just the cytotoxicity. So, so we decided to uh, explore a bit better um, in an unbiased manner what the CAR4 and the CAR8 were doing in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and this is using single cell RNA sequencing, uh, which uh, allow us to identify uh, you know, most immune subset in the tumor microenvironment and to start to dissect how the transfer of the CAR is actually reshaping the tumor microenvironment. I will just zoom uh, in in uh, uh, three uh, clusters, uh, in particular the, the host NK cells and the, the, so the host effector, the host T cells and NK T cells, just to highlight that uh, the transfer of CAR is uh, not only increasing the number of, of, of host effector, you see a uh, much more uh, uh, an increased uh, density of, of cells within this cluster when we transfer the CAR, uh, but this is looking at cytotoxic gene like uh, granzyme B or perforin. Uh, you see that this is also uh, uh, accompanied by uh, uh, an increase uh, in activation state uh, with a, a much higher expression of this cytotoxicity. So we can confirm uh, some, some of this uh, uh, finding also with flow cytometry. Uh, you can see that uh, NK cells are indeed recruited by, by, uh, uh, by both subsets, uh, CD8 cells, dendritic cells. And in general, uh, both subsets can do it, but CAR4 tends to be uh, better at uh, activating and recruiting the host immune system. And uh, this is also seen uh, when you look at uh, uh, activation, such as, for example, granzyme B 
uh, level, intracellular content, now that we can measure at the protein level, uh, you see that it's uh, uh, really uh, drastically increased by uh, the presence of, uh, of uh, CAR, cell, or CAR T cells, in particular by CAR, T, uh, CAR 4 T cells. And uh, there's also an increase in the antigen uh, presentation uh, capacity of the cell present in the tumor microenvironment. And this is an example showing you the upregulation of MHC class 2 uh, on, on monocyte. So when we look uh, at the bulk of the cells in this tumor environment, what's striking is that we see a very strong interference signature. Uh, and when we look at the individual subset, uh, genes that are known to be upregulated by interferon, such as MHC class one, uh, you can see that there's an increase in, in virtually every subset that we look at. So it's really a widespread interference signature. Uh, raising the question on whether this signature is actually dependent on uh, the CAR T cells derived interferon gamma. So we uh, decided to investigate this uh, aspect uh, simply by now using either CAR4 or CAR8 uh, T cells that were uh, either uh, competent or uh, deficient for the production of interferon gamma. Uh, and we now look at this interference signature. And, and again, what you can uh, appreciate from this graph is that the vast majority of the signature is indeed coming from the interferon gamma produced by the CAR T cells. So the interferon gamma play a role in this signature, but does it play a role in, in, in the immune cell recruitment and activation that we see? Uh, and the answer is uh, uh, largely indeed uh, you can see that uh, if you look, for example, at uh, activation of NK cells or uh, host CD8 T cells, uh, that the, 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 a large part of this activation is indeed due to the interferon gamma uh, produced by the CAR themselves. So this really, uh, uh, the, the fact that this uh, interferon response is really widespread uh, uh, can be a, a bit surprising given what we know about the interferon gamma. This is a cytokine that is really produced at the interface at the immunological synapse. So this is uh, uh, what, what you can see here. Uh, and, and, and in, in a, a slightly a different project, but a kind of related project, we, we were really interested in understanding how uh, local uh, or widespread this interferon gamma was acting in the tumor microenvironment. And I just want to highlight one of the ways uh, we, we use to try to, uh, uh, to ask this question. And this is using a reporter for STAT1. You know, STAT1, uh, it's translocated in the nucleus uh, upon interferon signaling. And we use a dual construct that contains STAT1 GFP and a, a, a nuclear and cherry uh, to uh, visualize the, uh, the response of the tumor cells to this cytokine. And, and this is in vitro. You can see that uh, in the absence of interferon gamma, uh, the STAT1 fusion protein is excluded or largely excluded from the nucleus. But in the presence of interferon gamma, now you have a more homogeneous distribution. And so. Um, we can bring this, this, uh, this reporter in vivo again. Uh, this is not CAR T cells, but I don't think it really matters. This is done with regular, with regular T cells. But what you can see is that in the absence of T cells, you have this uh, pattern where, where, where the, the protein is excluded or reporter is largely excluded from the nucleus. Uh, what now you have a widespread translocation uh, in the tumor cells in the presence of T cells. But what, what I think is really interesting is again, this widespread effect. So it's not restricted to the tumor cells that are in contact uh, to the, with the T cells, but it's really uh, something that is uh, uh, shared, uh, indicating a long range effect of the interferon gamma in the tumor microenvironment. Um, this is something that the also uh, Tan Schumacher group has, 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 has observed and published a very nice uh, paper. So if we, um, for example, look at 
the translocation score, depending on the distance to the clo closest T cells, there's really no correlation. Uh, and again, it's something that happened at the level of the, uh, of the whole tumor. Uh, and, and we believe this is really a collective process that is going on. So now I'm back to the car and, and, and just asking whether we've seen all this effect on the tumor microenvironment, but uh, how about the, the cars themselves? And, and so, uh, in fact, when we start to look at uh, the, the cytotoxic phenotype of the car themselves, uh, we see that if the car cannot produce interferon gamma, there's a drop in, in the cytotoxic uh, 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 protein or the cytotoxic gene that, that, are, that are important for, for, for their function. Uh, what's really interesting is that if we now take uh, uh, recipient host cells that cannot respond to interferon gamma, uh, to the interferon gamma uh, by using interferon gamma receptor uh, deficient recipient, we also see this the same kind of defect uh, in, in the CAR T cells. In the, really suggesting that there's a crosstalk uh, between CAR T cells uh, that produce interferon gamma, host T cells that need to sense the interferon gamma and uh, uh, respond in a way that will increase uh, the uh, cytotoxic, uh, uh, promote the cytotoxic phenotype of the CAR T cells. And so it's, it's nice to see this change in the cytotoxic phenotype, but, but does it really make a difference in terms of, of function? And, and here what we want to really know is whether the car uh, are, are still able to kill uh, something that is quite difficult to, 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 to quantify, but that we can quantify again with intravital imaging, because this is providing this type of unique information that, that we can uh, collect. And so what we observe again, when we inject a wild type uh, CAR uh, T cells, and this is done with uh, CAR A T cells, um, is that uh, again, we see a lot of killing event. Uh, these uh, are shown in all the circle uh, with the prototypical uh, contact, change in color, detachment. But uh, when we do the same with uh, uh, CAR T cells that are deficient for interferon gamma, well, this CAR, accumulate very effectively in the tumor. They, they engage the tumor cells into a relatively stable contact, but we don't see uh, uh, really a lot of uh, killing event. In fact, when we uh, quantify, there's a five-fold drop in the uh, killing rate when the uh, car uh, are not able to produce interferon gamma. So this really, uh, tells us that the interferon gamma is, is also important for the car themselves uh, so they can sustain uh, their cytotoxic activity. I, I'm just uh, mentioning that the car, before we infuse them, uh, if they don't have interferon gamma, uh, they are extremely effective at killing, like the wild type. It's really in vivo after a while, after a few days, that they lose this uh, uh, killing activity. And this is translated at the level of, 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 of the survival uh, because the therapeutic efficacy of the treatment is lost if the car are not able to produce interferon gamma or if the host is not able to respond to this interferon gamma, again highlighting this uh, uh, important crosstalk. So what makes the link between the interferon gamma and the cytotoxicity uh, of the uh, CAR T cells when obvious candidate is IL-12, which uh, works uh, often with interferon gamma and can impact uh, T cell cytotoxicity. And indeed, uh, IL-12 is increased uh, when we transfer CAR. It's, it's, it's a moderate increase, I would say, but it's uh, significant. And uh, it's, uh, it's increased in an interferon gamma dependent manner. So that if the CAR don't produce gamma, we, we don't see this increase. Uh, IL-12 uh, uh, seems to be largely uh, produced by uh, uh, a classical dendritic cell, uh, uh, type 1 dendritic cell. And uh, if we now, uh, the host is not able to produce IL-12, this is what you see, we again uh, uh, see a defect in the cytotoxic phenotype of the CAR T cells, very similar to what we observe when the car cannot produce interferon gamma. 
So all these data uh, are converging into a relatively coherent model in which, of course, uh, the killing capacity, perforin and granzyme, uh, is essential for uh, the activity of the car. But that's not the uh, uh, only function that the, the car uh, needs to have. Uh, the production of interferon gamma is key for at least two reasons. One is that because it will activate the host effector, and that can be, in fact, uh, extremely helpful. Uh, and secondly, it's because uh, the tumor microenvironment, by producing IL-12 and possibly other cytokine, will sustain the cytotoxic potential of these CAR T cells. And the final point uh, is really how this anatomical location impact uh, CAR T cell activity and, and are all the interaction established by CAR T cells beneficial interaction. And I would like just to mention briefly two observations that we've made. One is something that happens really within minutes of transfer of the CAR T cells when these CAR T cells encounter their target in the circulation. This happens, for example, if, if the disease has progressed a lot and there's a high tumor burden, then the CAR T cells can uh, see a substantial fraction of the tumor in the circulation. And what happens that uh, then is that the CAR T cells bind our target, uh, a tumor target, that can bind another car, that can bind another target. And this is resulting in the formation of cellular aggregate that gets trapped in the lung microcirculation. This is what you can see on this image, a really big aggregate made of car and, and tumor. Uh, you don't see that in the absence of a circulating tumor. And that's really detrimental because that is removing a lot of car T cells from the system. There's, there's much less car T cells that can uh, make it to the uh, actual site where the tumor is, such as the bone marrow. Um, a second observation that we've made is, is at, at the end of the uh, treatment, and, and some, some in, in this model, we, we often see relapses, and, and we also see relapses where the tumor that relapsed have lost the CD19 antigen. It, it's exactly like it's seen in, in, in many patients. Uh, but what I think was uh, interesting is that we often see this happening in the bone marrow, but it's not happening in the lymph node. And, and this prompts us to think that maybe the pressure exerted by the CAR T cell is different in different anatomical sites, meaning that the CAR T cell would be more effective in the bone marrow, and that's why we see emerging this antigen loss uh, variant uh, and less effective in the lymph node. And that's why we don't see uh, uh, emerging. So we decided to compare uh, basically uh, the, the killing capacity of the same target, and these are now circulating uh, B cells that we inject, uh, and compare at two different sites the efficiency of killing by CAR T cells. And, and what you can see is that the killing is really efficient in the bone marrow, but in comparison quite weak in the lymph node, <laughs> despite the fact that in fact the frequency of CAR in the lymph node is higher. Uh, what we believe uh, uh, probably contribute to this uh, uh, very uh, striking difference uh, is the microenvironment of these two organs, and in particular the fact that the lymph node is really prone to very strong upregulation of PDL1, this inhibitory receptor uh, that, that is detected in the lymph node but not in the bone marrow, and that uh, uh, we believe silence uh, the, the CAR T cells and reduce their activity specifically in the bone marrow, possibly creating a niche for, for escape. And uh, we can, of course, only speculate, but we would like to think that maybe this, this, this observation may explain why the response rate uh, for this uh, CAR T cell therapy is lower in lymphoma patients uh, uh, as compared to leukemia. Uh, and also uh, associated with less uh, emergence of CD19 negative uh, target. So to conclude this uh, second part, uh, a few observations that I think may be relevant for uh, CAR T cell therapy. First is that a circulating tumor uh, limit CAR T cell engraftment, that uh, we've seen that a fraction of CAR T cell is extremely active with re rapid killing dynamics, and that's probably accounting for their clinical efficacy. 
We uh, have learned also that CAR T cells boost the host immune uh, responses very effectively, and that's, I think, an opportunity to exploit uh, for combination therapy that, that will help to re re limit relapse, in particular when, when the antigen is lost. Um, and finally, also, what we've uh, learned is that the production of uh, interferon gamma and the crosstalk with the, TA, uh, with the tumor microenvironment is really key uh, to sustain uh, CAR T cell cytotoxicity. And finally, I would say that like in measure, um, many other uh, tumor immunotherapy, we, we should not assume that the treatment will work uniformly in all the organ. There are clear anatomical differences uh, uh, with a specific mechanism, and that's also true for CAR T cells. So with that, I would like to thank again uh, my lab, uh, and, and I would like to cite a, a few additional people that have contributed to the work, uh, in particular Zacharias Garcia, Fabrice Lemaitre, Beatrice Cor, uh, Yann Lomi, Renan Thibault, Pierre Bost. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. There's a, a, a additional uh, reference if you're interested by the work. Please uh, feel free to, to contact me. I uh, wish you uh, all, uh, uh, all the best for your research in the next uh, uh, months. And uh, in the meantime, uh, stay well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Philippe. This was uh, fantastic. Thanks for a terrific talk. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, so let me hand this over to Carla, who can uh, remind everyone how to ask questions uh, to Philippe. Thanks again. Thank you, Matteo, and thanks, Philippe. That was wonderful. Thanks for sharing your outstanding work, asking really very relevant questions in cancer immunotherapy through the lens of modern technologies. Thank you so much. So uh, before we leave, I just want to remind everybody that you can ask your questions via Twitter. You should be able to already find a tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Philippe Bolso here. Please remember to reply to this tweet with your question and do not forget to mention the hashtag Global Immuno and uh, the Bolso Lab Twitter account as Philippe is going to use his own Twitter account. So thanks everybody, thanks Philippe, that was a joy. And we look forward to connecting with you uh, next week for Andres Hidalgo's talk. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.